Michael Osterlink here from O Radio and Gary Collins. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were. I thought we were talking to Abel here. I, I just was a fly on the wall for a second. There. I was wow. off. I was at the beach. I think I was. I was oh, God, gone. <laughs> All right. So I know who I am, Gary. Say the name of your podcast. <laughs> Gary Collins, host of Your Better Life podcast and the SimpleLifeNow.com website. Nice. And uh, today, Gary and I are co-interviewing Abel James. Uh, welcome back to my podcast, Abel. It's been probably about half a decade since I had you on last. Decade. So, uh, We're dating ourselves. Uh, yeah, getting pretty old. You can see the gray hair, man. Stylish, uh, though. Abel like is the author one. Of quite a few books, The Wild Diet, Go Beyond, Paleo to Burn Fat, Beat Cravings, and Drop 20, to 40, 20 Pounds in 40 Days. Also, The Musical Brain. He is a podcaster himself, The Fat Burning Man Podcast. He has a few online programs, including a 30-day fat loss system and wild diet cooking class. He also has a few best-selling apps, including Caveman Feast and Wild Kitchen. Wow. Very busy man. I'm going to turn it over to you, uh, Gary, to ask the first question of our friend Abel. Oh, I got a good one, Mr. Abel. We, me and Abel go way, way back beyond podcasting and we've known, we've been in our circles for a long time, basically the beginning of the uh, when the paleo movement started to kick a little bit and then it became really big. A but I've noticed you, <laughs> what's that? A million years ago? <laughs> well, 2.5 million. To okay. be exact. Right. Um, but, you know, I noticed you, your life has evolved a great deal. And now you're in a different place. And I want to ask you, how did that journey begin and what brought it upon itself to get to this stage? I like that. Could you be a little bit more specific? Yeah, um, I'm going to be What change do you see from, your, from where you're sitting? Because I'm curious to hear. Well, for me, you know, when we first met, you were still just, uh, I don't even know if you had your toes in the corporate world still. I think you may have. I was just getting out, yeah. Just getting out. And uh, now you're just free floating, kind of a, uh, you know, a free range able. <laughs> and you're kind of doing your own thing. And I want to know where all this evolved from this, this kind of new journey in life and ex exploration. Yeah. Shall we say? Yeah. Well, I think it's really important to be a whole person. That probably sounds trite and weird, but the tendency is, especially if you're a type A and you just like keep on gunning it, uh, is to follow your successes and then paint yourself into a corner and then write a new diet book every year yeah. and hate yourself and get fat and lose your health and then become a hypocrite and die. I've seen a lot of people flame out and have horrible things happen to them all around them. But the reason I got into this is because I was really pissed that Jillian Michaels had the number one podcast. I'm talking about podcasting now. I'm talking about media, right? Like I was really mad of seeing these people and it's not that they're bad people, um, a lot of them. Uh, Jillian the Michaels, I don't is, know. I'd argue with you on that one. Well, maybe, maybe so, but I, I don't want to be judgmental. But what I would argue is that the narrative is coming from the top down and it is in service of corporations and not the people, not our own yeah. health. And so when I see things that violate that in, in the world of health, it makes me really mad. But at the same time, we live in a world where I know I, if I say certain words right now, this video will kind of get snuffed out and won't be seen by people. So if I'm told to not think about a white polar bear, then all I can think about is a white polar bear and eventually I'm gonna go crazy. <laughs> and so after being, you know, on a primetime ABC TV show, when a reality TV show personality becomes president, that was a very bizarre experience for me that happened like all at the same time. And I never want to be owned by anyone else. I don't want to be a puppet. I've had to dodge that bullet a number of times. And so as the years go on, I value my freedom and independence more and more. And I think it's more essential than ever that we try to stand up to some of the stuff that we're seeing that we don't agree with all around us. And so for me, I took some time away from the podcast and from writing about health and doing just the health stuff, though I had a lot of momentum and that would have been the right, you know, business decision to get ahead or whatever, yeah. or establish my credibility as a health expert. Um, but I don't really care about that. It's, it's more about, I think we're here to work on our spirits 
and, and to become stronger and to be in service, service of others. And I couldn't bite my tongue anymore about certain things. And so I had to put it into songs and poetry and books and other things to try to get other messages out there that are difficult to say in this context because the big names and the big faces that you keep seeing over and over again, they don't even own their own names and faces and it's getting yeah. harder and harder to find faces like ours. And so that, that's, that's troubling. Well, and me and you, we started in the health world on that side. We were both kind of disillusioned. I was a little different. I was, I was considered kind of edgy a little bit yeah. when I first came in, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe a little bit. So I pissed a lot of people off. Yeah. Um, because I called them out. I'm all, you don't know what you're talking about. You just need to shut up. Right. You know, I would just say that. I go, you're a blogger. You have no background in anything. From what I can tell, you were working at a car wash three weeks ago, <laughs> and now you have a fancy cookbook, and now you're calling, touting yourself a health expert because you have recipes of paleo pancakes, paleo muffins, paleo scones, paleo sugar bombs. Everyone's getting fat on your recipes, but you're the darling. And I, you know, I just left the FDA. You know, I'd yeah. left the government. So I had a big right. chip on my shoulder. You know, I'd yeah. left to follow a more, shall we say, true life, right? And I jump into natural health and I'm all, you guys are all just as bad as all the people you're portraying as the bad people. You're doing yeah. the exact same things. You're doing nothing different. Not all, but some, too many, I would argue. Too many, you're right, too many. Um, and oh my God, did I piss a bunch of people <laughs> off. And they came after me with just axes, machetes, and, you know, trolling me and just, just the, the root of everything that I went, this is what's wrong with the health world. And you guys are proving my point. And for me, it was funny, me and you drifted out. I drifted out earlier because I was already pursuing my off the grid stuff and I was moving away anyway, but we both just kind of disappeared. <laughs> yeah, health a little bit. We just said, enough. I've had enough. And I thought it was interesting that your path kind of evolved as well. And we're kind of, I'd say, not in the same place, but similar places. Yeah, actually, let, speaking of that, Abel, you, didn't you hit, hit the road with your wife in an RV for a little while? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We lived on the road for a year and a half out of uh, a fifth wheel RV in spending time like a couple of weeks at a time in national parks and state parks. We've lived in more states than we haven't at this point and and like really lived you know for a, a couple of weeks to a month to, to sometimes years in, in these different places and so we've been able to shop around for you know uh, clean air which is hard to find clean water which is hard to find a place that's not completely polluted by sound because i record a lot and i'm really sensitive to it and i just like the peace of the outdoors and if you're underneath a bunch of airplanes going over and you know shooting ranges over there it's like it bugs me out so we've been looking for um the right place i'll say places because you never arrive you're never there and as soon as you are you're gonna get bored of it and you need to go out on an adventure again and challenge yourself because that's what real living is that's what real growth is so for us we um we it's not easy to do as, as gary will tell you there are a lot of different steps you need to set up in your own life to get ahead of this but once you do and you're able to actually choose where you live and who you spend your time with or not and and go to new places that you never i didn't know that this place existed we live next to giant sand dunes in the middle of nowhere in colorado at eight thousand feet at like the highest desert um in north america and i didn't even know that this place existed a few years ago but now it's my favorite place on earth, you know? And so that's, that's some of the magic that starts to happen when you don't publish your 16th cookbook in a row or you don't like keep obsessing over social media or, or making more money come in. Sometimes like having more money is not great all of the time. You know what I mean? Like it's up and down, especially when you're an entrepreneur, not having enough money is a big problem. Having too much money come in and too much attention and too many people to deal with is also a big problem. So the solution isn't always bigger and better and more influence than all of that. Sometimes the solution is being like, I need to catch my breath for a second. Yeah. Well, you'll like this, Abel. I think you guys will both appreciate this. During uh, my presentations this weekend, people came up and wanted to take a photo with me and sign their books. That's what I'm there for, right? At, at Mother News. That's what I do. 
And it's funny how I have adjusted my company to that aspect of this isn't about money. This isn't about fame. This is about a message. And I've made it very clear. I do not need to do this. I can make mu much more money doing something else. Right. I don't have to do this. I do this because it's my life purpose and I want to do it. I'm a teacher. I want to share. I want to help people. That's the whole goal of everything I do. And this one lady, she was so nice. She, she was real timid and goes, Gary, I'd love to get a picture with you. And she goes, I know you're a very private person. So is it okay? And I went, oh no, that's totally fine. Come on. And, and, and you know, and then she goes, well, I'm going to share this on social media. I know you don't really use social media at all. And I know your beliefs on it. I go, oh, that's fine. I'm just not going to do it. <laughs> Yeah, And it was interesting to see someone who, who knows me and follows me and has read my books to understand where I'm coming from and that she was very uh, understanding to how I feel about certain things. Yeah, And that told me what I'm doing is right because she understood the message and that I'm not just here for the fame. And she was very careful with that. And it, it, you know, it, felt, it made me feel a little bad too. But good in the sense that she got that, hey, he's doing this a little differently. And yeah. you know what I mean? It gave me this, realize that my insulation level is working. Yeah. Without, without discouraging people. Yeah, well, we all used to have that. You yeah. know what I mean? It yeah. wasn't expected of us to like answer back a text message or an email or a phone call within seconds. That was never expected of us. We would meet up at a time that was previously agreed upon, or we just wouldn't, or we'd run into each other, you know? Yeah. And, and in a lot of ways, life was better. We had more freedom over our own lives back then, I think in our own way, but you realize that uh, you can do that today too. It's, it just takes a little bit more uh, finagling, you know? You, well, you could take no notifications off your phone. You can delete the social media apps. We can do all of these things. We don't need any of it. We can unplug all of it. It's about drawing your lines in the sand yeah, and deciding what's important in life. And this instant gratification and egocentric look at me consumerism model is not working. You know, we're the most prosperous country in the world by far. I mean, it's not even close. Yeah. We have the most freedom. We have the ability to, to, to utilize and show our free will and exercise it. I get to choose. We're very lucky. I get to choose my destiny in this country. No matter what you think, no matter what your political views are, demographics, it does not matter. Those are all excuses. And I get to choose these things. And that's how I feel about it. So people who are overwhelmed, and we are, you know, even though we're the most prosperous we've ever been, people are struggling every single day, worse than I've ever seen it before. And lost. And I, I hence back to the 70s. I grew up back up as a kid in the 70s. So it was before technology had really kicked in. Mm -hmm. You know, we were still using technology from the 40s and 50s for the most part. Nothing. The difference between me, my parents, and my grandparents was very little as compared today. It, it, today, it's quantum leaps. So that was kind of the last decade of where you could pretty much do everything you wanted without that human instant human interaction that you didn't necessarily want <laughs> yeah. is the best or, way to put it or ai yeah or ai there, now no, right yeah. it's like we're being notified by not people anymore it's not people who are giving these notifications for the most part it's whatever you know the controllers the conquerors want to notify us about hey, even hey, if all your notifications are off they'll still get them apple still gives them to me <laughs> Yep. They really oh, want yeah. to advertise to my face. Hey, well, let me ask you a question. He, uh, uh, Gary talked about lying in the sand and you talked about, you know, kind of stepping off the grid. You, know, you could have done your 15th cookbook and, you know, all that kind of good stuff. What led you to decide, like, this is a time for me and my wife to step off, get away from the fame, get away from the ego, get away from all this extra, even money that pro probably would have come in and create a you know, different path for yourself. What was the thought process that led you to that? Um, I saw a lot of things happening, rapid changes at the same time. When, when Gary and I started with this, maybe we were taking pictures of our food, but it was for education. It wasn't like, yeah. look at my food and how great it is and how great I am. Then it switched, switched into a, a selfie culture, 
the we started getting less um, organic traffic that started being snuffed out and uh, we weren't getting growth from the right people. And also when I did the TV show on ABC and it got quite big, um, we were living in Austin and it got to the point where I just, I couldn't go outside without having to worry about being approached and asked for a selfie and not the kind, like, like that's, a, as Gary was talking about it, I could deeply empathize, empathize with what he's going through. Um, we all go through it because it's, it's a weird experience to have a selfie taken with you. At the beginning, that was okay. Did the big TV show and people started coming up to me and, and literally like, like crowding me in spaces in grocery stores. I'm walking my dog, taking her for a dump or whatever. And it's just coming up to me and they're just like, not even asking. They're just like, I'm going to take a picture with you. Oh my God, it's, it's you. And my girlfriend's going to be so jealous or, uh, you know, my whoever's going to be jealous, they're going to hate that I was with you. I'm going to post it. And they didn't ask, you know, it turned into this monster. And I'm just like, why? If people were coming up to me after like the crowd started to crowd around me and they didn't even know who I was or what I did. And they started taking selfies, you know, and it was this thing that was just like, this is too much. We need to take a deep breath. This is I can see why it happens and how it happens. And it's not the first time it's happened in my life. Like I'm a career musician and I'm kind of used to like dealing with crowds and stuff, but the dehumanization of acts like that for both parties is something I don't want to be a part of. Uh, whereas engaging with someone who's in um, our community, who's listening to the message and agrees with it and also yeah. wants to spread the message of health and freedom and liberty and and doing the work and all the rest of the things that we stand for i love meeting those people i love yeah. you, you know the people my followers and the people in my community but that other side of things the media tv top down big celeb a-list culture is dangerous and for the first time I lost, in my life, I felt really bad for Justin Bieber. I'm just like, no wonder this dude is racing Lamborghinis all around and losing his mind and doing all these crazy things because this is not ancestral. There's nothing remotely ancestral about this. We are unprepared. Well, it, it was a switch, right? I, I compare yeah. it to, we went from, you know, idolizing idols and gods to now other human beings that we have put in that place, right? While other humanizing them at the same time the when same you put time. them on that pedestal, right? One was metaphysical, right? Now one is actually physical. <laughs> it's yeah. another person. I mean, you're right in front of them. And you're right. I, I look at it and I say, I always tell people, they go, well, Gary, if you ever get famous, what are you going to do? I'm going, I'm going to, I'm going to Dave Chappelle. I went, yeah. if it yeah. comes to that, I'll disappear in a heartbeat. And I'll come back on my own terms and not to say I'll ever get there. I'm not that, I'm not that guy, you know, I'm happy. My Who life knows? is totally fine. Who it knows? Was totally fine the way it is. And anytime I get an offer, I tell people that I go, you don't realize I don't need you. I yeah. don't need you. My life is fine right now. It's not about money. It's not about fame. It's about being happy and living within myself and my followers. I give every bit of extra time to my dedicated followers. I did a workshop too this weekend for people wanting to live off the grid. And I stayed an hour and a half because there wasn't a workshop after me and answered all their additional questions that they had until they were done. And they were shocked. They go, I don't know anyone who, who will do that. I go, why wouldn't I? Yeah. You know, I'm here, you're here, you already paid for it. Just because you paid for an hour doesn't mean I'm just going to shut you off and walk away. Yeah. Ask away. Ask all the questions you want. I'll answer them the best I can. I love that. Yeah. That's hey, the way it should be. Respect. You, you use yeah. the word ancestral. And I'm curious, how has your, your idea around ancestral living changed maybe in the past decade, especially since you kind of removed yourself from the movement and gave yourself some distance when you and your wife hit the road? Yeah. I don't know. Removing ourselves from the movement. I didn't see it as that so much as I saw a lot of close friends kind of burn out and a lot of other people sell out and the words start to be misused and bought and sold. You know, that, that was something that happened at the same time. I don't, 
it's it's not any fault of the community or or the movement at all and in many ways it's still there but it did get fractured and big money came in and kind of yeah drove some wedges between between us unfortunately and also just put different people on the hook for various things and it's weird too i think at the same time there are a lot of people giving out health advice and you don't know if it's paid for or not you don't know which things are advertisements who's a spoke spokesperson for what if they got these products for free who owns which company who invests in which company and and whether their stuff is actually what it says it is you know so as everything got bigger it became harder to trust the people who you know i was close to and also we moved from austin which is a big thing because i um contributed for for many five six years in a row to paleo effects and a few right. other conferences right. there so i was like the spokesperson literally the voiceover guy doing tons of free work for like all these conferences and all this stuff and um i got burnt out i did too much free work and i did <laughs> i i don't know kind of enough paid work not enough paid work i don't know how you do that balance because money isn't the thing that i want or need but sometimes cash flow is just like oh crap you know because i also have a, a thing that i'm running even having a newsletter list costs thousands of dollars every month having um, these websites whether i'm doing anything with them or not costs thousands of dollars every month this team that we need to help schedule these shows um, because it takes more than all of my time and more than all of my wife's time. We have a team that we pay and we pay taxes on all this stuff. So it's like, it's definitely a balance and, and it's tough, but I saw, and I know, I know how hard it is, especially for the people who might not have as much uh, attraction or traffic or whatever online as, as we've been fortunate enough to have. Um, but when I see like good people kind of selling out against their own will and losing their own ability to, to say what they want and be as free as they want, then they might as well be Jillian Michaels. They might as well sign that deal where it's like, I don't own myself anymore. And, uh, and it's deeply uncomfortable for me. And I think I've, I've definitely sacrificed, you know, not, or I've sacrificed income by just saying no to all sponsors and saying no to everything because having to sift through was so much work and trying to see who's telling the truth and who, who wasn't was so emotionally taxing. I just had to say no for a really long time. But now as, as I kind of come back, it's, it's been really rewarding over the years to see people who may have been there at some of the first conferences that, that I was um, meeting up with people at way back in the early 2010s in Austin. Now they have their own companies. They, you know, I'm drinking their broth and, and eating their soups and trying their little treats and concoctions and all this other stuff. And they are the doctors now and they have their degrees and they've grown up and they've started their own podcast. And that is so cool. And if we can get anything out of it, I think it's that we, we've been building over time, a group of leaders and these will be it, when things go sideways. And it seems like they're kind of going sideways right now. These will be the survivors. These yeah. will be the people who help shepherd the next generation to live a life that, that, you know, I don't, sustainable is a troublesome word, but like we need to think generations ahead and the people who are driving us into the ground aren't doing that right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you've, you've recognized it too. I I've looked back. I recently just real briefly, I didn't spend a lot of time on it, but I went, you know, I'm going to go back and look at some of these people who are the darlings seven, eight years ago. And I started looking yeah. at their books and see if they had a podcast or website anymore. And almost all of them were gone. Wow. And I'd realized that I built like you, I built my model for long-term. Yeah. Does that mean I'm going to come out of the gate screaming with a ton of success? No. What it was, it was a piece at a time, you know, an overnight success that took a decade. Yeah. And that's how I looked at it. You know, I make a living as an author now. That's unheard of. I mean, that's a very small percentage of authors it's in hard. the world. It's and hard. that's a huge accomplishment for me, but I did it my way. Yeah. And would you say, what, what was the biggest lesson you learned by going through that process? And Michael just takes off. He just, <laughs> he's had enough. He's gone. He's heard enough of this crap. <laughs> Not, uh, I wanted to get, uh, it was oh, fun. nice. <laughs> Thank you.
I was looking over my over my shelf, shelf over there. <laughs> I thought you just said I I'm out. I've, I've heard enough of this crap from these two. Um, but what would be the biggest lesson in that transition? Because you would have kind of I would have figured you were considered in that grouping. And it's funny, all those conferences you got to speak at. I'm a former FDA special agent, U.S. Department. They never asked me, and I, that's where really? I got offended. Never huh. been asked. And if I applied. None of them ever responded back to me. Any of these ancestral health bozos and all these people who said they were all in it. I went, why would you not ask me? I was actually, of all the people you're bringing to your conference, I was the only one who was actually there. <laughs> and they're all, nah, nah. We're going to get Katie, this blogger, who looks really cute and has 50 million people on Facebook to present. She has no background in health, but don't worry about it. Yeah. That through me. So what was the lesson out of that transition? What was the biggest lesson you learned as you kind of transitioned out of that group? Um, I had, uh, I think it was on Easter weekend, I had like six or seven of some of the top paleo ancestral health cooks and, uh, and cookbook authors over to our house. And we all we cooked up like our own concoctions in the kitchen, had, had a delicious bird and, and of course, lots of bacon and all this other stuff. And I, I can't really think of a better example of community or, or a better day. I went with uh, Chris Cresser and Bill and Haley Staley and, and a few other paleo people to go get grass fed ice cream at a paleo conference. And it felt like we were fighting the same beast, and there was, a, there was a lot on the line. And we didn't have much resources, like any of us. And uh, we were there because we believed in it, mostly because, you know, I, I'm in this because I got really sick. And I was afraid of dying by my age now or having a heart attack. Like, I, I got into this because I was burned. I was one of the consumers who was trying to do it the right way, who got sick by trying to do it so right, according to my doctor's recommendations. And so uh, a lot of people became part of the problem by selling out. A lot of people were forced to as social media took away everyone's traffic and gave it to the big names and the Fox news is and that MSNBCs and the rest of it. Um, it became, it, and YouTube pulled all the, the ad revenue. I never got money from, from stuff like that. Certainly not significant money from advertising or anything, but a lot of people did. And that all kind of dried up. And as hard as it is to be an author, it's like a lot of these people didn't publish their own books because they're not book publishers. And if, if you want to go out on your own and really do this and start your own business, you have to do everything yourself. And I think what it is, it's just, it's too hard. It's too expensive. People are being squeezed too much right now. It's hard enough for us. Me and Allison have a hard time sometimes. Over 10 years of doing this, I mean, it yeah. is definitely not, always easy uh, with as much juice as we get. And we get juice sometimes, right? Like we're willing to do the work and take big risks um, going on these reality shows and stuff like that is like, I, I know that I'm setting myself up for disaster if I don't play it exactly right every time I do stuff like yeah. that, but, but it's worth it. We got to keep fighting. And, uh, and I guess I'm really realizing more than more and more. It's like, this is definitely a marathon. This is something that people may get a lot of juice for a short while. And many people do, but it's not 15 minutes of fame anymore. It's like 30 seconds and yeah. people are, are gone. And if you don't build a business around what you're doing, if you don't build a community, if you don't have your message straight, then you're not going to last because it's too hard. I think yeah. that's where it's just too hard. Well, and it's funny, we both agreed we were not going to write 50 bazillion health books. And that's why I a couple of things transitioned me out. You know, part of, uh, you know, I was in life simplification and everything just started changing for me. But it was me going on my own life purpose and adventure yeah. that did it. It all happened organically. I didn't force anything. You know, that going off the grid book, I never intended to publish that book. I'd never just planned to write it. It came about people asking questions about it by accident, yeah. you know, of my life and what I was doing. But you're right that, that the people who sold out, and I learned this, I think I was lucky in the sense, I learned this in the government by yeah. investigating a lot of people who were in the gray, I would call it gray of criminal activity, a lot of them, but they had crossed that ethical line 
and a lot of them obviously were in health with what I was doing, health, food, drugs, all that, that I found once you cross that line, you can't take it back. Yeah. And they had, they, they were miserable. Some of these people were very, very rich and yeah, they had yeah. the best lawyers in the world. We really could, we really couldn't touch them. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was no way. <laughs> and, and, you know, I saw that, but they still weren't happy. So I had a different perspective when I started my own business that I knew that I couldn't sell out. If I sold out and I crossed that line, that was it. I'm done. Yep. And what I've noticed, the people who did that, some of them, I won't mention names. Um, you may have mentioned a couple. Um, they are coming full circle, realizing their errors in life too late. You know, I, I go, go look some of these people up on Yelp or some of these health or doctor ratings and go see what their rating is. It's bad. Yeah. And yeah. they're yeah. because they did a lot of harm to people because they were trying to scrape nickels mm -hmm. and trying to make a living. And I've always taught entrepreneurs, I go, you need to make sure you have an ability to support yourself prior to you being a full-time entrepreneur. Because yeah. the acts that will cause you to be desperate and conduct desperate acts will be a lack of financial resources in order to live. And yeah. I've watched it. I know the people exactly who you're talking about, and I know they did it. They were ripping off everyone known to man, double charging credit cards, all kinds of crap because people told me about it. Yeah. People were emailing me. They were their clients, and they go, this guy did such and such and this and this. And I went, whoa. Yeah. I went, yeah. A, I would never do that no matter how desperate I, I was. But B, that person is 100% on my never, ever recommend list to anyone, yeah. period. No matter what they do. Because my attitude is people go, well, I'm a second chance guy. I go, no. Once you've gone that I'm a first far, chance guy. I'm a one and a half chance guy. <laughs> yeah, I'd give it a one and a half. You know, if they came to me and said, hey, Gary, I know we've had our problems in the past and, and apologize, said I've changed my ways, I would think about it. But yeah. I'm not going to let someone solely my reputation that I haven't done anything by recommending them to someone else when I know they've done these things. Yeah. No way in the world am I going to do that. Yeah, it's I'm tough. Sure you felt it's the same way, right? I feel the same way almost every time I do a collaboration, but I realize that you have to play ball. You can either unplug, which, which I do. I think it's very healthy. You need to do that sometimes. But also, if you, I realized that if I only had people who I totally trusted on my podcast, I couldn't do it anymore. Honestly, that's why I stopped for a while. It's like I ran out of people to talk to who I really trusted. And if I'm not getting out there and meeting people in, in person and, and going yeah. to all these different conferences like I was, but I'm not anymore, it becomes a lot harder to meet great people and truly trust them and know that they're going to, uh, you know, treat your community who you send their way well, not abuse them. And I, I have so much dirt. I don't know what to do with it <laughs> on almost everybody, you know, yeah. and nobody's perfect. Yeah. I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. But, uh, but I think it's also important to play ball to some degree. You know what I mean? It's like you have to take that risk and you have to give them that one, one and a half chances. And, and people can redeem themselves, but usually they don't, unfortunately. Well, they don't. Yeah. Hey, hey Abel, um, in the 10 years that you've been involved or more kind of in the ancestral health paleo movement, how's your, how's your thinking changed? Not specific to individuals and the yeah, yeah. You know, challenges that we're, we've been discussing, but like in terms of like your thoughts around diet, nutrition, movement, exercise, sleep, social engagement, things like that. At the beginning, I was so skeptical of supplements um, because I had been burned by prescription meds and I, so, I, I saw so much just profiteering in the world of, of supplements. Um, after, go, you know, Going from my mid twenties to now my mid thirties, uh, my wife and I went through carbon monoxide poisoning this past year, and um, it was a really close call, really rough trying to come back from that. But I started to realize the value of um, nutraceuticals, certain herbs that you really feel when you're below baseline. I, I guess it was the first time I'd been pulled below baseline for like almost 10 years again. And, and so I started to realize that certain things are very helpful. Certain things you can feel 
other things you, you can't, but of course there are some supplements that work really, really well. And I probably would not have said, I wouldn't have admitted that. I don't think 10 years ago, or, and, and maybe I wouldn't have known that 10 years ago, but I've seen that work. And so that's kind of in some ways counter to ancestral health, but I don't think so. You know, it's like, if, if we're aiming to get a whole spectrum of nutrition for a very, very complicated body, yes, we can survive on almost anything, but I think there is an optimal level of a ton of different nutrients, some of which we know, some of which we don't, that we should be trying to hit. So that was one big thing for me. I, we were carrying around bags of supplements and no prescription meds when we were trying to heal ourselves and doing a whole lot of different things. Also, it's like... <laughs> I'm very skeptical when I'm contacted by a company and they're just like, Hey, fat burning man, you know, who's going to be the perfect product for your audience yeah. ours. And you know, who's going to be the perfect guest on your podcast. Me. Yep. Um, I get like a hundred of those emails a day and every once in a while I get one where it's just like, okay, what's the product again. And so when juve, the red light and near infrared yeah. light um, got in touch with me, I was just like, what's that? You stand in front of a light for a while and then you're supposed to feel better and get better sleep and your skin improves and all your collagen and all this other stuff. Like, okay, whatever. I'll try it. So I did a bunch of hill runs and really punished myself up at eight, 9,000 feet and um, did recovery in front of the near infrared light and really felt it. I was, I was like, oh, this is something. There is, there is something here. There's cool tech, um, biohacking tech not just red light therapy, but self quantification devices. You know, I'm, I'm tracking when we were poisoned, I tracked some of it through my uh, ring and was able to track tons of different metrics and, and really see what happened and learn how to recover through these things. And uh, it's tough because I don't totally approve of any of this. They could easily be spying on us and selling this information about my heartbeat and my Ill illnesses to health insurance companies. Um, the red light therapy device that, that made me feel tons better and still does, I do, I do it often, could be giving me cancer. We don't know. Um, and so I, I think it, it's really important to understand no matter where you're at, that we don't have all the answers, but collaborations are important. Trust is important. It's just hard. We've been burned so many times and it's, that's why you've got that grizzled beard now, I'm sure, Gary. And I've I had it, when I unplugged, I had a big grizzly beard. Big grizzly beard. You know what I mean? It's like that's why you've got to. It's harder than ever, but we've got to take some personal responsibility for all of this and and get rid of all the distraction and all the cultural norms and just be like, wait a second, what do I want to do today again? You know, because that's what a lot of people are missing. And Gary, that's one reason I just love your work because that's what you teach people to do. Take a step back, be like, what do I want to do with my life again? Oh, I'm here, I can do something with my life, let's do it. It's hard though. Yeah, well, and, and for me, I pride myself on not being, not only conventional, but not giving in. Yes. And, and as you know, and, and Michael knows, it, it's hard. My path that I took was probably the hardest you're gonna take, because I just, refused but i knew that 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 the payoff and doing what i wanted to do and helping people was more important yeah. than giving it and it's funny you say that about the infrared technology i'm about ready to enter into a partnership on a product that i found and was referred and a friend uses on the same similar technology and i've been looking for this solution for a long time and i go <laughs> oh i found it yeah. But I was like you, Amal, the guy was pitching me. And if he wouldn't have known people I knew and been around and knew one of the guys I know for 30 years, I would have blown him completely off <laughs> right. and went, that is crap. Get away from me with that stuff. I don't want to hear it. It's going to, you know, make my penis longer, make me taller, all this good. They just, it wasn't that he was very straightforward and I used the technology and it was what it was. <laughs> I yeah. went, you can't really manipulate this too much and even knowing that i'm going in a little tentative mm -hmm. but i agree with you you have to do these partnerships at some point and that was interesting uh as we just said that uh a microsoft product just did something very odd okay that's great bill. <laughs> thanks bill 
Yeah, so, yeah, Bill, I've given you all my information and all my <laughs> money. So, hey, leave me alone. Um, but yeah, and it's hard because, you know, you don't, it can get really lonely too if you don't have these For partnerships sure. and relationships. And you don't want to completely isolate yourself either because you start to lose touch. Right. And I call it one foot in, one foot out is how I live my life. Yeah. I have one foot in the modern world where I'm paying attention, watching what's happening around me. And I have my one foot out where I live my own life and I insulate myself from all that noise, distractions, and it's a balance. And sometimes that balance gets a little off one way or the other and you just recorrect. Yeah. But believe it or not, people, I spend a lot of time around people, guys. And <laughs> you guys know this. But people, some people think I live off grid and I isolate and I'm in a cave and I'm writing a manifesto and all kinds of crazy stuff. And I go, no, 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 no. I'm out and about. I'm out a lot, but I do everything. Selfies. Oh, yeah. Well, I do things on my terms, though. That's yeah. how I tell people. It's my terms. Yeah. That's how I do it. That's the only difference, really. I mean, with social media, you know, I use it as a tool, but I don't yeah. use very much of it. Good. Hey, Al, you know what? That's what I was going to ask you. Sorry, I got off on a tangent. Abel, with, the, with social media, what was the transition primarily out of that? When did that start and how did you do it? Because I think a lot of people would really like to know that. Yeah. So, I mean, we're on the hook for social media in a lot of ways. Like if people look, look me up or look us up and try to find our work, I want to be there for them in, in whatever way we can. Um, but at the same time, I think there was a critical time. It was like 2015, 2016 when social media really changed for the worse it went from kind of being the little guys and the professors and the nerds and whatever just being like no, let's talk about ancestral health to being high just uh, such a mess it turned into a mess and i read a, a bunch of research back around that time after the tv show um you know i was on social media connecting with people in 2016 and all that um but i read a bunch of research that said in not no uncertain terms the more time you spend on social media the more depressed you are and not subtle. It's like pretty much true for every social media service. And also it's like, we've had, we break even most of the time. 2016 was a good year and it was getting too expensive in Austin, too crazy. Um, the prices were just going nuts. It went from being kind of like a small college town to LA in like yeah. a couple of years. It was crazy. And so, um, once again, it was that selfie thing too. It's like people want to see pictures of me with my shirt off or pictures of my face over and over and over on Instagram, right? That's, that's what everyone does. I don't want to do that. I, that's not teaching anyone anything. Um, not that I'm, I'm willing to dress up in a baking costume or take my shirt off sometimes to prove a point or be silly or whatever, like no, no judgment there. But what social media has become is not educational. Like every fifth um, post is not from your friend. It's from someone who's buying. Oh, that was another big thing. People after the TV show and after the wild diet, my, my book it became a Google search trend in the top 10 search trends in 2016. Oh, wow. <clears throat> and um, other people bought my name and they bought the wild diet across all properties. And to this day, they still do. And it's some people who we know, some people who are friends have been buying my name, buying my community, buying my fans, buying my mom who complains to me that she is targeted by some of these people with these disgusting advertisements targeting my mom. I, I couldn't deal with that anymore. You know what I mean? I, I just, it's gross. It's really gross and I don't wanna be a part of the problem. And also, to be fair, <laughs> after like 2016, Almost every single one of our web properties, social media assets, social media followings, where we have 40,000, 50,000, 100,000 here and there, wherever, all stopped completely for like four years and have not grown ever since on pretty much every platform. And it's like, huh, that's interesting. <laughs> I can't believe, I never knew that, Abel, of all the discussions we've had. Um, I didn't know people were actually buying and targeting using your information. I knew people did it. I didn't know. I, and I'm pretty they sure I know millions. Who, I pretty much know who they are. 
I mean, yeah. me and you, you wouldn't mention names, but I'm a former investigator. It wasn't that hard for me. To yeah. And, uh, and I laugh. You're right. Some of them are multi, multi millionaires today. And yeah. I call them and they're complete ass clowns in life. And I feel yeah. bad because you'd put a lot of faith in a couple of these people. And I kind of warned you a little bit on one of them. <laughs> yeah. And you went, well, I'm going to give them a chance. And I'm all, oh, this guy, I, oh, I don't know. And, I, and I, we won't mention because it it's not fair. Um, yeah. But yeah, I didn't know it. Well, I, pre I mean, Gary, the whole time I've been doing my show, that's one of the only times that that's ever happened, that, that someone's warned me about someone else. You know what I mean? And, and I was in my 20s and I just, I was trying to be as ignorant as possible and, and you know, like naive in an optimistic way because I, I, and turned down pretty much everything back then because I knew that life would get harder and I wouldn't be able to afford to do that forever. But I really appreciate you saying that and, and giving advice and being the one who, <laughs> who had seen a few things and wanted to pass along your knowledge. That's what we all need. We need to be honest with you each other not walking on eggshells trying to protect each other politically because we're all invested in each other's companies or movements or whatever that's gross that's incestuous yeah. and that's a cabal of its own you know that's like a health mob and i've seen that it's pay to play you know yep. if you want to be one of the big names you got to pay to play and you got to pay this person then you got to pay this person they're going to pay you and you got to send your list and they'll send they, their list and it's like oof that's what is this that's not <laughs> That's well, and I don't do that right? lightly, Abel. I'm not here to ruin people's careers or do well, anything of course, yeah. like that. But some of these people are really bad actors. Yeah. And they're putting on a persona that they're, they're this thing and behind the scenes, they're actually something very, very different. Yep. And I was trying to protect certain people because, you know, people are not, I'm almost, I turned 50 this year, you know, so I was older than a lot of the people who were in the movement. And not only that, right. but my background. You know, I, I have a pretty good BS meter yeah. and I could, I could Too smell good, a rat. Maybe. Yeah. When I saw a rat, I knew a rat and yeah. it was kind of that, but you had, I was trying to be careful with them. But my attitude was when you get into the area of health and I mean, you talked about this, you can kill people. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you literally can kill people or damage their health very severely in a mall. Hey, if you get into this health world, you better have good intentions because if you don't, the damage you can cause is right. a ripple effect. Yeah. And that's where I took, and because of my background again, I, I mm -hmm. saw it firsthand. I saw doctors, you know, I saw a guy putting in stents in people in their 20s to make five grand a pop, ruining people's lives forever. Right. And I went, you can't, you can't do that. And I was trying to weed some of these people out because I could see their bad intentions. Yeah. And of course, some of them caught on and, you know, people would talk and next thing you know, I'm the enemy. And it was hard because it, it, it damaged my, you know, my, not my reputation per, per se, because the honest people knew I was doing it out of good faith, like you. Yeah, yeah. But the flip side was it did hurt my business. Right. Because, you know, they weren't, they weren't going to play ball with me at all. Right. And I got called uh, an insider. A couple of people told me I was still working for the FDA and I was just doing investigations on all the, I'm all, you guys are. It was probably the insiders who called you that. <laughs> oh, it, no. And that's, what I mean, it was, I, I'm all, you're out of your friggin' mind. You know, yeah. you've lost it. And so, yeah, I, I always, and that's what I respected about you. You know, you always were trying to do the better thing. But it's hard Trying. We get surrounded by these people. And, you know, without my experience, that's what helped me. If I didn't have that experience, yeah, oh, it would have, it would have been a sheep to the wolves, man. I, they were just hunting a lot of them. Yeah. 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 But if you're playing long ball, that gets ugly because they hunt each other too. And they hate each other too. Like yep. they kind of hate us because we're willing to be honest. You more than me. I, I bite my tongue to maintain peace a lot of the time but i definitely have strong opinions <laughs> behind closed doors but we need that honesty because uh yeah it it gets gross out there and it's pretty gross right now but you raise a good point about loneliness because i didn't want to step away from any movement i didn't want to step away from any community or people oh i didn't, I didn't either want to step away from you guys either so we need to find some way i think to 
to keep in touch and, and also do work together in one way or another um, that's outside of something that could be polluted by commercial interests, like social media was, like a lot of these conferences were, like a lot of these com- companies that all of a sudden, oh yeah, I've got a whole board and investors now. It's like, this board owns you. Like you, you gave yeah. your life, what are you doing? Why? For money? And uh, it seems like that's what happened kind of like in the mid 2010s is uh, uh, we, we had these small conferences for a while and, and this movement, we're writing books, working hard, no one's really making money until it started to get really big. And then people are like, oh, we can make money doing this? We can make a lot of money doing this. Let's yeah. make a ton of, and then they just started making as much money as possible at the expense of the movement and at the expense of the community and, and, and tricking people and selling. <laughs> like, I can't speak at a conference where I can't eat any of the food products that they have, that they're selling there. You know what I mean? Like when the banners are behind me and I wouldn't touch this stuff, it's like, I, you can't use my face like this anymore. If, if this is what's going to be behind me, you know what I mean? That's as bad as being on TV and, and being sponsored by Coca-Cola or whatever. It's like, it's not worth it. We need to find some protected way and I think you're doing it. We're all doing it in our own ways with these mini communities and, and in our own neighborhoods and that sort of thing. But that's what it's going to take. Hey, Abel, let me ask you a question. I just also want to plug your book, The Wild Thank Diet. you. So uh, I asked you over the t- past 10 years, what have you, where, where has your thinking changed? You talk about supplements. Yeah. Um, two other questions. Has your thinking changed also on specific types of food that at one point maybe you discounted now you're okay for some people to eat versus being strictly ideological back a decade ago that's haram cannot eat that that's anti-paleo whatever the paleo god would would right. you know, smite you and also how has the ancestral principles influenced how you relate to people because i heard you know you and gary talk about kind of the negative uh relationships that are kind of out there i'm thinking yeah. more like in terms of your wife and your close friends Things like that. Maybe I'll start with, with that. No, I'll start with what's changed. Um, and the answer is not a whole lot, thankfully, because w- what I tried to do when I first kind of got my book together and, and was blogging and then started up a podcast, because the book kind of, I, I wrote a few of them in different forums and all that. And um, it's so much less about a great food or a great workout or eating right after you work out or doing intervals that are 20 seconds times 10 seconds, 10 times. <laughs> it's, it's so much less about that. And it's more about doing the tiny little things every day that add up. Um, so it was more short term thinking when I was younger and more performance oriented. And now it's much more longevity and, and kind of lifestyle based in the sense that it doesn't need to be hard and just because you can go out and run or lift heavy doesn't make you a better man. And it could be hurting you if it wasn't the right day and you're not recovered. Um, I, I was just sharing a story where yesterday I was, it was so sunny and I wanted to go for my seven, eight mile run. That's like what I really wanted to do. But I had woke up this, with the sniffles kind of feeling a little rough. And so instead of doing that, I had to suck it up and pump the brakes on my ego a little bit and be like, all right, let's grab the dog. And I ran for 10 minutes, never even breaking a sweat, just at a slow pace, just kind of getting myself moving and, and then came back and that was my workout. And that is for some people much harder than going out and running a marathon, you know what I mean? And so that, that's something that's, that's changed for me in a lot of ways is seeing the wisdom on, on the other half of that, on the recovery side of things, on the invisible side, or on the staying no. There's a lot of power in saying no, but it's, it's really about those tiny little invisible things where it's like you're waking up every morning and having this coffee or you're having heavy cream or whatever. And all of a sudden you're 20 pounds heavier, you know, a couple of years later, but you take one of those things out and it's like, oh, that kind of coffee just didn't work for me or that heavy cream. I should take a, a break on that. It's, it's really important to, um, and I share that story because Gary Tobbs was on my podcast years ago saying he got back because there was too much heavy cream in his coffee and he just kind of forgot it just snuck up on him it happens to everyone no matter how much of an expert you are you know what i mean so uh you've got to be honest with yourself and you have to stay humble how about the uh ancestral principles that guide your relationships like with your wife or your friends and stuff i read um a few books about how how 
just the value of being present with someone, even if you're doing something completely insignificant, is, is so valuable and powerful for that relationship and for those people, especially certain kinds of people. And for me being kind of like a lifelong performer in a lot of ways, I feel like if I'm not doing something big, it's like I'm not doing anything and it's not important. And so uh, I can't imagine our ancestors doing anything big and impressive all that often, aside from like running down Buffalo and spearing them on foot and just like jumping from tree to tree and who knows, navigating oceans just by the stars, all these things. Um, but being physically present and just hanging out with someone, not doing anything that's, that's all that remarkable is extremely powerful. But even more than that, if you can do something, if you can go out and be on the hook with someone else, even if you don't like them, you will by the end of it. If you're on the hook, like, so we live next to these 14,000 foot mountains here in Colorado. And if you start to get above the tree line, then it gets real, real fast. If you're not uh, agreeing with the people you're with, you're going to die. <laughs> Someone's going to have a really rough time. You're not going to get down the mountain. You know what I mean? So even if you don't totally see eye to eye with some of these people who may be around you, when you go out on the hook and you come back together, that really builds a powerful tribe, um, a powerful community. And so I think part of that is really taking it, doing nothing together and then taking risks together. Nice. Thank you. Appreciate that. Gary. All right, Abel, of all these years of learning and trial and error and helping other people, what would you boil it down to someone beginning now? What would the advice you would give them starting out from scratch? Because the statistics are astronomical today. Yeah. Compared to when me and you started, they were bad. Today, they're mind blowing. I, right. I didn't think we would get here from 2010. It's dystopian to 2020. a little bit. <laughs> it, it, it's really disturbed me. And I yeah. tell people the eyeball test alone in the last couple of years for me, it's really shocking. I go, I can literally see America getting bigger every year. Yeah. And I go, that's insane. I'd never thought with all the information we have and when we started out that it would get worse instead of better. Right. So for that person today, the average American, you know, who may probably has never really exercised, never played sports, sedentary, 50, 100 pounds overweight on average, it's bad. What yeah. would you recommend for them? You know, what would you go, hey, if I could go back in time and I was in your shoes, this is what I would do. This is the simple steps to get going. I would try not eating and be okay with that and not fear it. Um, most people uh, haven't experienced hunger. They don't know what that feeling yeah. is. They don't know the sensation that comes along with not eating as soon as you wake up. Um, so if, if someone doesn't know what it feels like to wake up and then not eat, or if, or if that's uncomfortable, I would argue, then you should probably be try, <laughs> you should probably try not eating more. You should probably try squishing your meals into half the day, say, eat from 12 to six, one to seven or 10 to four, you, you do whatever you want. For me, after compressing my eating for a while, I've been doing one, maybe two, but usually like one and a half meals a day where I'll start eating um, around three, sometimes two, sometimes four, um, sometimes six. And I'll start with uh, usually uh, something ancestral based, which could be a, a broth, um, all clean, it could be fresh veg, could be a little bit of fruit. Um, and then we'll get some nice pasture raised meats for dinner cook something up and have a big feast. And we'll usually have a nice homemade treat for dessert as well. I, I love having treats. I like, I think elimination diets can be very useful, but even more powerful than that is having the ability to not eat when you don't want to, or you don't feel like it because that becomes a superpower over time. And if you're running on carbs constantly and you can't get by without food, then what's going to happen when you don't have access to food, when, when things go wrong um like they could you know when you when you don't <laughs> growing up in new hampshire the power would go out and we get ice storms and stuff like that so for 10 days we just have to fend for ourselves sometimes and sometimes you know your car gets stuck or you just can't get a meal and 
if your immune system is getting all beat up because you can't handle eating every two hours, then that's a su survival risk, you know? And so I think you don't have to buy anything. You don't have to do anything. Just like try not eating for, for a few hours and see how you feel. There's a whole world <laughs> waiting for you. Yeah. <clears throat> it's funny you say that. I actually teach a lot of that today. I'm telling people the, the biggest step you'll make is not eating on a schedule. Yeah. And understanding that, you know, that's what we're ingrained from the time where we hit some level of consciousness as a kid, you know, where we have some reality based where we can interpret our outside world and make this basic decisions is eating schedule. It's just, yeah. yeah breakfast here, lunch at this time, dinner at this time. And I always tell people, you have to break that. You have to, people are shocked and they go, when do you eat and what do you eat? I go, it's different every single day. And they can't wrap their mind around that. Yeah. Starvation is a natural process of every animal, except mm -hmm. for humans <laughs> today. And that's yeah, part of the problem. even tickle it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Abel, uh, uh, Gary and I want to thank you for being on our mutual shows. <laughs> thank you. So uh, how can folks find your book, The Wild Diet, find your podcast, Fat Burning Man, your online courses, your best-selling apps, all that kind of good stuff? Thank you. Yeah, uh, go to fatburningman.com to find all the Fat Burning Man goodness. My new book is called Designer Babies Still Get Scabies. That's at designerbabiesbook.com. And just by looking up fat burning man, you'll probably find the people who have paid for my name and eventually you'll find me. So just look a little harder. <laughs> oh, man. That's nuts. That is that crazy. Sucks. <laughs> well, Abel, thank you for uh, joining us. It's great to see you. Hopefully uh, we don't have to wait another six years before I have you. No, let's, I would do this every weekend with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> you have a great day. Man. You too. Thanks.